peoples of the worldwide federated internet what's good Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on this episode of The Thinkening. I greatly appreciate it. As I always say, you could be anywhere listening to anything, but you are here listening to me on The Thinkening. I do not take that lightly. This is your precious time and you're spending it with me. We are at an impasse. And I'm going to, I know I, I, I said this last video, but I'm going to say it again. Conservatives are going to be mad. Libertarians are going to be mad. Liberals are going to be mad. The right, the left, everybody's going to be mad about what I have to say. And the reason is I'm trying so hard to be balanced. I have my biases. As I said before, we all do. But having biases does not preclude you from being balanced. Right. You can be biased and say, yeah, this is this is my thing or my subject or my thing. But, yeah, I understand that this 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 and this is wrong. You can do that. I do not like the way Donald Trump speaks. He does some good things, but the way he speaks, uh, I'm like, uh, bro, you could have said that a different way. And maybe he's surrounded with a bunch of yes men. And maybe he just doesn't listen. I don't know. Either one of those things is true. Here's where the balance comes in. I understand why he speaks the way he speaks. I'm not telling you that it's right. I just told you I don't like it. But I'm also telling you I understand it. I am saved. I'm born again. I have believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What governs me is different from the majority of the world. God is what governs me, his Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean everything I do is right. That doesn't mean all my viewpoints are right. That doesn't mean that that everything I ascribe to is correct. But I have a different governor. Again, this isn't my Bible podcast, but everything I do is informed and filtered through the Bible. The Bible says it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is my governor. But I understand the world at large does not have that governor. I do not. Uh, I am. I don't know the heart of the president of the United States, which, as as we stand right now, is still Donald Trump until the twentieth when Joe Biden is inaugurated. So, that's what I'm referring to. I don't understand him. I don't know what's in his heart. I'm not in his heart. I can't tell you uh, what he's thinking. I can't tell you why he did what he did on in one instant or another. I don't know. I am not his judge. I am not his God. But I can understand after being attacked continually, you got to remember, he was attacked by every Republican universally. Um, I'm talking about the, the, the established Republican Party. I'm not talking about uh, people who identify as Republicans politically, politically, the general masses. That's not what I'm talking about. He, during the debates, he was universally, I'm talking about during the primaries in 20, uh, 2015, 2016, he was universally attacked by every Republican while they were all debating. And while they all had their agreements and disagreements, the one thing they were in lockstep with is they didn't like him. Everybody ridiculed him. The media ridiculed him. The the Democrats ridiculed him. The left ridiculed him. The right ridiculed him. He was attacked on all sides. He came out swinging. I'm not telling you that his approach is correct. Again, I'm telling you, I understand his approach. 
So that's balance, right? I can say I don't like what he says and I don't like how he says it, but I understand why he why he's his approach is that way. Doesn't make it right. I would not respond that way again, as I said, because I have a different governor. I'm governed by something else. And I cannot vouch for the the president's salvation. He's made statements and lived lived and lives his life in such a way that would lead me to believe he is not a believer. Now, that doesn't mean I am correct. I am not the judger of men's hearts. I'll let that be known. All right. Now, let's jump ahead. Parler, a social media application, was banned from the Google Play Store. They have a right to do that. They're a private organization. They were banned from the Apple Store. They have a right to do that. They're a private organization. They were dropped from their uh, from their web services provider, Amazon. Amazon has a right to do that. They're a private organization. They were dropped by their legal team. Legal teams are private organizations. They have a right to do that. They've been dropped from what I understand by all of their sponsors. Sponsors are private individuals and have the 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 legal right to do so. But do you see a pattern here? And do you not think that this pattern is a problem? If all of these conglomerates are in lockstep with a specific ideology and a specific political party they have a right to do that but when all of these pieces start joining uniting with that political party in their attack toward a certain individual or business there's a problem there's a problem we have to solve we are at a we are at a unique point there's a unique happenstance going on and the unique happenstance is you have the tech giants that clearly I would say are in cahoots. They talk with each other. I had, um, I told this, this, uh, story earlier in a group chat. I've had two Instagram pages banned. I was never given a reason why they were banned. And this is the problem with stuff like that. Okay. So the president of the United States is banned by Twitter Facebook, um, Instagram, Pinterest, Spotify, you name it, another couple other organizations. And I believe there was some payment processors that are banning the president of the United States. Let that sink in private organizations. They have a right to do that. But at what point? So when these private organizations are all in lockstep and and also while being in lockstep with each other are also in lockstep with a political ideology and are also on top of that in lockstep with a political party. And they have the power to completely eliminate all competition. If you don't think that's a problem, we think differently. Now it's a hard problem to solve, right? Our greatest strength in the United States is also our greatest weakness, and that's the delicate balance. Our greatest strength is our freedom, but that freedom is also our greatest weakness. Now, do we give up freedom for security and safety? No, and I don't think that's that's a necessity. I think the problem we have is we have complicated situations, and I'm not saying I have the answers. I don't, but I can recognize that we have complicated situations. There are some answers, but answers that are not being explored by anyone, or it seems like it's the fatted calf. No one wants to touch. For instance, section 230. I believe the president was misled by someone in his, in his cabinet. He wants to get rid of section 230. And this is where I agree with Tim Pool. I've actually read Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. I downloaded it. I have it on my computer. It's it's the 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 whole document is a lengthy document, but Section 230 itself is relatively small and fairly understandable. I mean, it, it honestly is. 
all we had to do, honestly, really and truly, and I don't know what legal department this would have fell under. I don't know if it would have been the Department of Justice, uh, the FCC. I, I really, I honestly don't know. And I'm admitting that to you. I, I don't have all those details, but reading Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, one thing is definitely very clear. And this, so the, the president signed an executive order to this end. Really, it didn't even require this executive order. All it took was for some official to look at this and say, okay, you are a platform, but if as a platform, you are executing editorial license, you decide not by legality, but by what you like or don't like, or by ideology, what you will allow that makes you now an editor. And as an editor, you do not get to retain the protections that fall under Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act. I did a video on my on my other podcast, Brook Noms World, on this very thing, on the communication on Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, namely the executive order that that the president signed toward that end. And, and really, you'll see if you read Section 230, it's like, bro, why, why did you even need an executive order? Why didn't why didn't someone within the broader scope of his administration, whether the FCC or DOJ, merely apply Section 230 as it is written? Right? Because this is how that would break down. A company that does not have protection under Section 230, here's how it works. If I say something against a certain person, that person can sue the company for defamation. They don't even have to sue me because the company, if if they are an editorial uh, um, uh, outlet, then they are responsible for what is on their outlet because they are the editor. And that is what these companies are acting as. They're acting as editors. All they had to do was apply the law that's on the book. And this is what I never understood. I don't understand. I don't understand Washington, D.C. And I think that's by design. I, I can't remember if it was Ronald Reagan that that made the statement of governance by by mystery. I, I, I don't don't quote me on that. Look up his statement. I, I believe it was something like governing by obscurity or mystery, something like that. And it shouldn't be. But that's what's going on. It's kind of like the tax code. The tax code is governance by by mystery, confusion and obscurity. It's things that you need a team of lawyers to comb through to see what loopholes you can get. And this is this is the problem with what goes on in Washington. Right. There's tax codes and laws that are written and the people who can afford a legal team and spend the money to have that legal team comb through all of these documents and find out exactly what they can do and what loopholes they can find the loopholes. But the average person, me and you, we have no legal team. We're not going to look through every single tax document to see every single loophole we can get. And look, you can say what you want. This is what's funny. This is what's funny. And, 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 and this is where people can't be balanced. And people have their political leanings and ideologies, which blind them from what is actual. Tim Cook appeared before, I believe it was Congress some years ago. I think it was shortly after Steve Jobs passed away. And they had a problem with his offshore accounts and some different things he has overseas. Do you know what his response to them was? And I'm paraphrasing, but you can look it up and find a video. His response was, I am only applying the laws that you passed. The laws that you passed allow for this. And if you have a problem with that, that's not my fault. You passed these laws and I'm only abiding by the laws you pass. Translation, you wrote into this some loopholes for your friends. Well, I have a team of lawyers that found those loopholes and now I'm enjoying the benefits of the loopholes you passed. 
This is what Tim Cook said. You can go find a video. As I said, I'm paraphrasing, but that's pretty much what he was getting across to them. But yet some people on the left hand side of the aisle have big problems with these companies and what they do and they do this and they do that. OK, rightfully so. But these same people defend Tim Cook because Tim Cook appears to be on their side of the ideological fence. You see where I'm going with this? Like we can't be balanced. We can't have a balanced view. Like, yo, it doesn't matter what side I lean toward. It doesn't matter if I agree with a person. You can, Why is there no duality of thought, right? Like you can both agree with a person and in another instance, disagree with that same person. You don't have to have complete allegiance with men, with a political ideology, with a political party, with a certain group of people. The only thing I trust 100% is God. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. So the Lord is the only thing I trust in 100%. Everything else is like, ah, yeah, you might be right over here and over here. I disagree with you. We are headed for something unique in history. I don't know what's going to happen and I'm not going to sit here and predict anything to you, but we have what I would consider right now a technocracy. And the reason I say we have a technocracy is because if private businesses can silence now, I understand I hear my libertarian brethren out there um, and 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 I hear you. I get you. The president can go on um, and hold a press conference and it'd be aired everywhere right now. But we've already saw how that worked out. Do you remember when the, uh, the president of the United States was holding a press conference and he said something and most news organizations cut the feed and they say, ah, oh, the president is saying something that's not true. Can't verify. So we're not going to cover this. They can silence him. They can still silence him. Again, these news organizations, again, private companies. Right. But just think about what we're inching toward. Our, our greatest freedom is also our greatest weakness. It's that delicate line. And we have to figure out a way to navigate this. I'm not telling you I have the answers. But I'm at least acknowledging that I see the problem and I'm, I'm trying to think through this to figure out what is the answer, because we need one. But if these if these companies can silence the president of the United States of America, who's in control? And, yeah, it's all fine and dandy when it's the guy that we don't like. I don't care. This is where I'm at. I don't care if I do not like a person and I do not like what they say. I don't want them to go away. They have a freedom to say it. I just won't listen. I go somewhere else. I just won't listen. But that's not what we're doing. We are headlong going into this mob mentality. I'm going to tell you the next push. The next push is to get rid of the Electoral College again. On my other podcast, Brook Nam's World, I did a video where I went over the Electoral College, the importance of it. Once that's gone, mob rule is in. Get ready. It's only a matter of time. Now, I'm not doom and gloom because I'm going to tell you as a believer, this is my standpoint. And again, I understand that everyone who listens to me may not be believers, but where most people see tragedy i see opportunity this i have never engaged with so many people on biblical topics people that want to discuss biblical issues people that want to know what the bible says about x y and z this never in my life have i have i seen and maybe it's very possible that it's because I wasn't paying attention, but never in my life have I seen such interest in biblical topics. The harvest is plenty. So I'm I'm optimistic in that regard. Now, I'm not op optimistic in the fact that I think everything is going to go right. I don't know that. And that's not promised. 
right? Nothing is promised to go right all the time. We may be in utter turmoil, but again, for me, I'm looking at it like the harvest is plenty. There's people to be reached. When and the, and the thing about that is, you a situation can be changed if we can get to individuals, which is as a believer the unique opportunity we have. People have legitimate questions about serious matters now, serious spiritual matters that they may not have paid attention to before, but here we are. People are interested. Those of us who believe the Bible, who've been saved, I'm not going to say we have every answer, but we have the answer. The answer that matters. We definitely have that. So there's an opportunity. Now, with, with that opportunity in place, I can recognize the opportunity and also recognize the sweeping issue that we have. I was doing some reading. Two people brought this this man up. So one of my boys sent me a message and he brought up Dietrich Bonhoeffer and I was at a men's prayer breakfast and Dietrich Bonhoeffer came up. What's funny about that is I was just asking myself a few weeks ago, maybe maybe a month ago. I can't remember, but I was like, what were Christians doing during Nazi Germany? Were they were they saying anything? Were they vocal or were they just silent and, and dejected, ejected from the situation? Because I've always said we can't remove ourselves from the conversation and then be upset that the conversation goes sideways. What do we think is going to happen? The Bible says the heart is 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 evil. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? Had to get the verse out, stumbling over my words. We we are at a time and we are experiencing something that is unprecedented. Now, when I say unprecedented, I'm not saying that uh, dramatically, like I'm not trying to over dramatize this. When I say unprecedented, I say that in the truest sense of the word, this is the unknown. We have literally entered into the unknown. We have private tech companies that can shut down the speech of the leader of the free world. That's bonkers. That is bonkers. I don't, this is where I'm at balanced. Not only do I not want the government to have that power. And thankfully the constitution bars the government from having that power. I don't even want tech companies to have that power. This might not be a popular opinion. I think we need some amendment to the to the constitution and this is what i mean we need an amendment concerning free speech that makes this free speech thing an absolute thing that's across the board whether you're a private company or this or that you cannot infringe on a person's free speech period now that doesn't mean that a person has a right to incite Violence, And I'm talking about literally inciting violence. I know again. OK, so here's where the left is going to get mad at me. I don't like what the president said. I think he should have been more measured with his words. And I think someone around him should have said, sir, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's not your place to encourage people to come to the Capitol uh, when electoral votes are counted. Maybe let somebody else do that if they want to. But you doing that would be perceived in a certain way. Right. But him encouraging people to come to the Capitol and protest is not an is not a call to violence. Right. Because this is what I and this is what I always try to say about balance. You don't know what's in that man's heart. You can't say, you know, what he well, what he meant to say, well, that's irrelevant. You're talking about what he meant to say. We we can come to all kind of conclusions. What did he actually say? Right now, unfortunately, 
all of the tech platforms have completely scrubbed what he said from the Internet. But I saw what he said and what he said was not a call to violence. He said, come to the Capitol uh, to, to, for to stop the steal uh, a rally is going to be wild. That's not a call to violence. You can infer that all you want. We could draw our own conclusions all we want. It's not about that. It's about what is actual and what did he actually say? Right. There's a lot of things people say that I infer things. I do. I, I do it my own self personally, but I also understand that's just my inference. That doesn't make it true. What they what they actually said is what's true. Now, my inference on what they meant is irrelevant. It's just my opinion. We are in a weird crossroads, a weird crossroads. And you have, in my opinion, you have fringes on both sides that are pushing for something they don't want. Everybody thinks that they want a revolution. A revolution is bloody. A revolution is violent and nobody wins and it's not peaceful. And 99.9% .9 of the times revolutions don't work out well for the countries in which they happen. Contrary to popular belief, this is we don't live in a utopia. We live in a world filled with sinners. This is not a utopia. This will not end well. It will not be unicorns, rainbows and lollipops. That is not how this works. There's a very complicated world filled with sinners. A revolution is not what you want, even though it's what some people think they want. Because see, you have again. So this is where I'm going to make some conservatives mad. You have people on the fringe. Who believe we need to take up arms and just take this whole thing over and do this and do that. Look, man, look, man, this is not what you want. I'm not saying that this country will stand as it is for, you know, forever. As a matter of fact, I know it won't. Right. And maybe maybe the country will get to that point at, at some point. It's always a possibility. I'm not naive, but that's not what you want to be calling for. Trust me, you want to exhaust every effort of diplomacy and conversation you can. And when I say exhaust, I mean, to your voice is sore. You want to exhaust diplomacy. Because fighting violence, revolution in the streets, again, I know that's what people think that they want. But what people think they want and what's actually necessary is often two completely, totally and, you know, just two separate things. Right. We, we have to accept reality for what it is. And the reality is we all need to chill out. Be a little more balanced. And and understand what we see going on. Parlor was literally nuked from existence, from orbit. Blocked off the Apple store, blocked off the, the Google store, Amazon removed them off their servers. These companies have the ability to eliminate their competition on ideological grounds because that's all it is. They can paint it however they want and say whatever they want. They eliminated Parler because Parler was a threat to them, but they had the power to completely shove them out of the picture. That is a problem that needs to be dealt with. The president of the United States of America has been silenced. And again, you can say he can hold a press conference. We saw how that works when he says something that the news organizations don't like and they're all in lockstep. They just cut the feed. Social media where the conversations are happening completely cut them off. This is not good. It's very alarming. 
And we all need to collectively get our heads together, get our heads out of the sand, stop all the bickering. And we need to sit down like, look, and, and another thing is our enemies are watching it. So here's what makes here's what makes a civil conflict dangerous. I'm going to throw something out to all you guys calling for civil conflict. If we go into an all out civil war in the United States, let's say that happens. What do you think China's going to do? What do you think Russia's going to do? China's already been flexing their muscle in different countries, flexing and flexing. If we're out of the picture, not only are they going to flex, they're going to go beyond flexing and they're going to start throwing blows. And those blows will eventually come home. We don't want this. Y'all know what it is. Stay frosty, people.